Olá! Thank you for watching this video series on translation and technology brought to you by the Language Resource Center at the University of Michigan and the Corpus Driven Terminology and Translation Research Group from the University of Brasilia. My name is Elisa Duarte Teixeira and this is what we are going to go over in this video. On video 6, we are going to focus on comparable corpora and their use on translation. We will very briefly review corpora for translation as introduced in previous videos and then move on to characterizing and giving some practical examples on how to use comparable corpora as well as monolingual corpora to solve translation problems. So as I said before, when we were when we are working with translation, we can use parallel corpora as a source of information as, as, as I have just shown to you. But we can also use comparable corpora and monolingual corpora. So now let's have a look at how comparable corpora can be useful for translation. Comparable corpora, as I explained before, is when you have similar texts in the same area, same text typology, same genre, but they were produced independently in each, in each of the languages that you are working with, usually by native speakers. So they have the most up-to-date, the most current, the most um, used language by that community, if you are careful enough to choose the right texts to put in your corpus. So that's something that with comparable corpus is very important, is that how you put comparable corpora together. So if you want, you want your corpus to be minimally representative of that area that you are trying to grasp. So if you are translating, again, chocolate cake recipe into another language, you can put a comparable corpus in the target language of five recipes, of a hundred recipes, or of a thousand recipes. A thousand probably is too much because I guess this one kind of recipe is kind of repetitive. So maybe after a hundred or two hundred, we are pretty much representing that kind of, of text in that particular area. But if you think, how can we represent the language in the whole or the medicine area or some particular sub area of medicine or law? So that's something you have to take into consideration when you are putting a comparable or using a comparable corpus in your translation. So one example that I can show you of comparable corpus that have been put together by other people and are now available for consultation is the Cortec corpus. It's available in this website that I noted here. And in this particular case, the comparable corpora available there, they have about 200,000 words in each language, English and Portuguese. But that doesn't mean that they are similar, always in the same, in the same uh, features. For instance, uh, Carvalho, 2006, to put a 200,000 words comparable corpus of commercial agreements together, she had to, to have 48 English agreements and 134 agreements in Portuguese. Why is that? Because Portuguese agreements are much, much shorter because they refer to the to the laws instead of including all the parameters and all the details inside each one of the of the agreements. So this is a cultural difference that you can notice when you put uh, recipes to <laughs> not recipes uh, corporate together. And the same thing happens with recipes. Recipes in English are much more detailed than than the recipes, for instance, in Brazilian Portuguese. But when you start putting a comparable corpus together, you start grasping 
the differences and the similarities between two languages and two cultures. So that contrastive look is even more present here than it will it is in a parallel corpus. But how can I use comparable corpora to solve translation problems? Let's have a look at some practical examples. Now let me give you another example here uh, with cooking recipes, which after all, it's my area of, one of my areas of expertise in translation. So let's say that I need to translate the adverb finally, that we can see a lot in recipes in English, into Brazilian Portuguese. When I look at my corpus, I can see that finally is the most frequent adverb in English, right? After I put together this corpus with 1.5 million recipes in English, 1.5 million recipes in Portuguese. And then when I run the word list, finally is the most recurring adverb of, of my list. It occurs 3,251 times in this particular corpus. And it has several collocates. It co-occurs with several different verbs. If I have a look at the, at the concordance lines, we can see some of these combinations of words here. If I go to all the 3,000, these are the most frequent collocates. That's the word we use to refer to those words that co-occur frequently with a certain word that we are looking for. We have chopped 2,500 times. Then we have sliced, diced, grated, chopped, and shredded. So chopped is the most recurring one, as you can see here. So let's have a look at chopped. How would I say finely chopped in Portuguese? Would it be finamente, finamente picado? Then when I look at the frequency of finamente in this corpus, which in theoretically is very similar to my corpus in English, it only occurs 337 times, which is very strange. How can I possibly have this occurring 3,000 times and the prima facie, the first equivalent that comes to my mind, only occurs 300 times in my this, in this other corpus in Portuguese that has the same kind of texts, the same number of texts, more or less. It's very strange, right? So what do I do? If I have a look at what occurs with finamente, which is the first translation that comes to mind to finally, and I'm going to find pique finamente, fati finamente, picada, etc, etc. So we can see by looking here that there is no equivalence between finamente and finally in recipes, although they might be equivalents in some other contexts or in the dictionary, right? So what's my, what do I do? if I cannot translate finally for finamente, and I don't know what's the word that I'm looking for, we do what we call the indirect method of searching. I'm going to see what happens besides finally chopped. I know the translation or the prima facie translation for chopped is picar, chop, picado, picada. So I am going to look at that verb in Portuguese and see what occurs with this verb that might be a better translation for finally, since finamente seems to be not adequate in cooking recipes. And when I do that, I can see that chopped in Portuguese, picado, picada, pique, all of these are occurrences of the verb picar, the first adverb that occurs is bem, which translates as well. So you see the difference? And it occurs 620, 621 times, so twice as much as finamente. But also, we also see the diminutive 
occurring in Portuguese. Like picadinho is like chopped very tinily. That means chop a lot or finally chopped, right? So from looking at these examples and looking using this indirect method, we are going to come to the conclusion that the adverb with which picar, picado, cocor is the most in Portuguese is not finally or the equivalent for finally. is bem, which would be well in, in English. So well chopped, well, ver, well finally chopped. And also the diminutive, right? The, this inho, inha that we use a lot in Portuguese with 396 occurrences. So we can conclude that in cooking recipes, finally does not translate as fi finamente, but, trans but translate as bem picado or picadinho. So see how we can sometimes use the corpus to find equivalents that are more adequate to our particular kinds of texts. Now, to finish this presentation, let's have a look at how we can use monolingual uh, corpora or electronic texts to help us with translation. Let's say I I'm translating a text and into English and all of a sudden I need to use the expression to be nice to someone or with someone. Because in Portuguese, we say be nice com someone. This preposition can be translated as to or with. So I can go to a corpus like the Coca corpus that I've shown you before and type nice and have a look at what are the prepositions that occur to the right of nice in the first position, which is highlighted here in green. And if I look at the results, I can then see that two is the most frequent, but with also occurs, like a fraction of the times that two occur. And if I want to go even deeper, I can go into the concordance lines and see what might be the difference or what might be the contexts where I use to and where I use with. And that's going to help me produce a more natural and more fluent text in my target language, which in this case is not my native language. Here's another example of a monolingual corpus that can help, can help you with translation. The web as corpus or web corp uses the internet, the, the content of internet as a corpus. And you can do searches by typing your search word or expression and, and then choosing the language. In this case here, I'm showing you the search for the scientific name of bacalao or salt codfish. If I type that gardu, gadus morhua, in the search box and then choose a language that's probably going to give me the equivalent of salt codfish in that particular language. So it's a good way to, to use the internet as a source of linguistic information for translation. Here are some useful links for you to explore other corpora available readily available to use in your translation project. And we are going to continue to work on corpus and translation in the upcoming videos. I hope this content was useful to you. Please help us spread the word. And if you want to learn more about translation and technology, check the other videos in the series. Obrigada!